Welcome back everybody. This is Eric here, Iraq Veteran 8888. Um, we took a little special trip here to the Antique Arms Show, uh, the Riviera, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, you know, we come to SHOT Show every uh, year to check out all the new products, but uh, this day we're checking out all of the old products that nobody can get anymore. And I've got uh, Ian here, Hoss USMC with me. Hey brother. Hello, brother. How you doing? Good. So, uh, you ready to go around and look at some, some old guns? Yeah, I was thinking about wearing this thing. Really? <laughs> I don't know if they made armor or fit guys like you back then. Yeah, well, you know, I was I was of the era when they just went into battle naked, so. Okay, you run into battle naked yeah. and that's supposed to, to strike fear into the enemy, huh? Yeah, it's a good thing they don't do that anymore. <laughs> okay, man. Well, uh, let's have a look around. If we see anything noteworthy, we'll let you guys know. Um, we don't really have a plan, and uh, sometimes that makes for the best videos, so we're going to have a look around. If you see something crazy, we'll let you guys know. You never know when you're going to run across a treasure. Yeah, man. That's it. You know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. That's right. I can't imagine there's probably some old granny that found something like this in her uh, you know, basement and said, oh, I don't need this anymore, and just threw it on the curb or something. You know, it's just crazy. A lot of people just don't have respect for the older firearms and you know older items that are laying around. And yeah. Some people just throw them away. They just don't think they're worth anything. They don't want to mess with them. Uh, I can't tell you how many times you know I've had some little old granny and he come in the shop and bring us a Springfield trap door for 50 bucks wow. because they just want it out of the house. You know, their husband passed away. They just want to get rid of it. So uh, there's a lot of that going on, you know. So, well, cool. Let's have a look around. See what we can come up Let's with. Let's go. Let's do it. All right, we got some swivel guns here. Check this thing out. It's a uh, flintlock swivel gun, large bore, kind of like a, a big blunderbuss, and it's mounted on a little cradle here. It's the kind of gun that they would use to like shoot at each other in ships and that sort of thing. So. Uh, Pretty interesting setup, you know, and it's actually on a swivel. You know, it's not meant to be fired from the shoulder, but a large rifle like this, uh, about six grand for that. <laughs> but you know, flintlock, so I imagine reliability was probably somewhat spotty. It's got a uh, tower marked uh, lock, so definitely British made. There's another one here. Um, it's also an English yeah, they've made, been, they've a one inch bore uh, ship swivel gun. Uh, that one's about nine grand. But I mean, obviously, you wouldn't shoot that from the hip or, or from the uh, shoulder or from the hip or any other place than this swivel. But, uh, you know, this is back before they had AT4s and rocket launchers. You know, they had to sling, uh, you know, big old uh, round lead balls at each other, you know, to sink each other's ships and, uh, you know, pick each other off and that sort of thing. And then here we have a, uh, a beautiful uh, 17th century uh, cannon. This is a bronze cannon. Uh, you can tell it's bronze because of the way the patina has occurred over the, the surface of the cannon. And uh, it's pretty ornate, you know, beautiful cannon. But uh, you can just imagine, you know, sitting behind this thing and, you know, touching off in the flash hole and, uh, just the amount of, uh, I guess, fear those guys instilled in each other with these uh, types of devices. So uh, definitely a neat setup. I, I love, I love old guns. So uh, if we see anything else noteworthy, we'll let you guys know. All right, we stopped by the uh, Turnbill uh, Manufacturing booth here at the Antique Arms Show. And I tell you guys, they've got some beautiful firearms. They do uh, beautiful case color and case hardening work on their guns. Uh, they've got a lot of customs. Uh, here in a moment, I'm gonna show you a beautiful um, AR-15 that they're making. I don't know if you guys remember last year, but uh, at SHOT Show, they had a uh, beautiful commemorative that they put together. And uh, these guys are just putting out some top notch work. Uh, very beautiful firearms. It's almost so nice, I don't even want to touch it. I, I felt like I need to break out the uh, white gloves to touch these things, and uh, they're just beautiful guns. Uh, let me grab one of these ARs. You guys are gonna love this, hang on. All right, we got a beautiful AR-15 that's set up in the a typical turn bill fashion. Uh, beautiful case coloring, case hardening process they use on these, beautiful furniture. Uh, this is just one of those rifles that it's just so nice. I mean, look at it. It's, it's an heirloom quality. Uh, AR-15 that, you know, this is something you pass down to your family members and your children. Um, and man, I just can't say enough good things about these rifles. Um, it's just so so nice, you almost don't want to shoot it, you know. 
Uh, these rifles are very boutique. Uh, they're very pricey, but they're, they're expensive for a reason. So uh, I'm going to include the contact information for Turnbill Manufacturing here in the description box. Uh, if you guys are interested in having an investment uh, grade uh, heirloom quality firearm uh, commissioned, I would most certainly consider uh, talking to these guys. They're putting out some great work. I mean, it's just top-notch stuff. Turnbull also does a really high quality restoration. Uh, we got some Colt firearms here that have been uh, restored uh, by their, you know, by their services, by their factory. And then they've also got some uh, factory guns that they actually manufacture. Uh, over here we got some Turnbull uh, factory guns, and these are 1911s that they actually make. You see ones that have beautiful engraving. Um, there's one here that has some beautiful case coloring on the frame. Of course, a very fine firearm. That's the Heritage. Um, these are very, very high-end 1911s, um, but they're worth every penny. If you guys want an heirloom quality, investment grade uh, 1911, you probably need to check these guys out. I mean, they're expensive for a reason. We got a lot to look at, and I need to get Hoss in here. So uh, let's have a look around. If we find out anything uh, cool, we'll let you know. Pretty cool. All right, we got a beautiful uh, Japanese Type 22 Mirada. This is not like a standard Mirada. Most Miradas are single shots. This is one that was actually set up on the Mauser style uh, magazine conversion system. Uh, this one's an eight by 53 rimmed. Um, you know, a lot of the early uh, Miradas were 11 millimeters. So this is a very, very uncommon rifle. We just thought that you guys would like to see this. Um, I probably won't ever get a chance to, to take one of these out to the range for you guys because a rifle like this is probably around three grand. Um, some of you, if you have deep enough pockets and you're interested, uh, collectible firearms actually sell on this gun. Um, I can, I'll pipe through some information in the description box in case you guys are interested in looking at some of their inventory. Uh, they're based out of Texas, really good people. I've done business with them before. I've bought stuff from them. Uh, this rifle set up pretty much just like a Mauser uh, would be at the time. You know, it's got the lifter system, much like a Kripus Shack or, uh, you know, any of the other type of firearms that are out there. It's basically a repeater version of the Mirada Action, although it's been changed a bit. You know, the Mirada has that, uh, like, Beaumont style, that big, you know, bulky uh, bolt handle that they use on the Beaumont. This is set up more like the, the Mauser pattern uh, that was changed in, like, the uh, 1880s. So this is a very early uh, smokeless repeater, but I'm sure the early ammunition used uh, black powder. Um, as with many of these firearms, they're built to a very high quality standard. So later on, they did uh, utilize smokeless loads in them. Uh, they would have specialized uh, reduced smokeless load uh, that, that they, they would use in these firearms. I just thought you guys would like to see this because this is very, very rare. Very obscure firearm that almost nobody has a chance to shoot or even touch for that matter. So I'm glad I got to show it to you. All right, we got a Gatling gun right here. Uh, Hoss is going to tell you a little bit about the story, the history of the Gatling gun. What Hoss? Yeah, you know this this particular uh, Gatling gun was actually used, um, there's a little placard back here and it, and it talks about it, but uh, I, I'm actually a, a, a Gatling gun aficionado. People don't, I don't actually realize that. It's one of the only guns that I'm actually really interested in, in the history and all that. Um, these were used a lot, but this particular one was used in uh, when um, the U.S. invaded Canada back in 1902 and we burned Toronto to the ground. <laughs> and most people didn't hear about it because it was such a small battle <laughs> and uh, yes, we were still using Gatlin guns in 1902, and it was actually just a bunch of uh, disgruntled uh, mailmen from Canada that had immigrated to the U.S. and decided to go ahead and reinvade. So, Gatlin guns. There you have it. That's yep. the Gatlin gun in a nutshell, guys. Yep. Thank you for the history lesson, Hall. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, yeah. man. All right, we got a big bear trap here. Um, this is actually what they uh, used to use to catch rogue YouTubers like Hoss back in the day. Um, you know, they had to stop making them because they considered it to be a little bit, you know, inhumane. But uh, we see that Hoss is still around, so it's good. I actually that have a wooden foot. I think took it. <laughs> yeah, you know, he got caught with his uh, his his buddy earlier. You know, the bear that uh, he was stroking his beard earlier. So, you know, I, th I think uh, Hoss is actually descended from bears. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> 
All right, we got a nice little Mazden uh, M47. This is a very uncommon rifle. Uh, you don't really see them uh, too much anymore. Uh, this particular rifle was produced by Mazden, and yes, that's the same Mazden that produced the uh, machine guns, the World War I era machine guns for the French. Uh, this was produced for the uh, Colombian Navy. Um, this particular yeah, rifle, they're so. very uncommon, yeah, uh, and reason being is because it was a very small contract of rifles. They didn't really produce a whole bunch of them, and that was mainly because by the time that this contract was filled and delivered, bolt-action rifles were on the surplus market after World War II, and there were just so many bolt-action rifles floating around out there that they couldn't give them away. So when Mazden was contracted to produce the M47, uh, obviously, by the time the contract was ready to be filled and paid for, no one could give the guns away. So, it, unfortunately, it was a, a, a day late and a dollar short. Uh, it's a nice firearm. It fires a 30 alt 6 cartridge. has a very unique uh, Mauser-style uh, bolt-action system. Uh, very nice uh, diopter sights, completely adjustable. So, uh, they are very fine firearms, and they do represent... A, a very high amount of quality uh, for a surplus firearm. But unfortunately, just like the FN-49, it was one of those guns, it was just kind of a day late and a dollar short. Uh, but nonetheless, a very interesting piece of uh, small arms history, and I thought I wanted to show it to you guys. Also at this booth, we've got a beautiful little uh, martini action. Uh, this is an Australian 3220. Um, for those of you that don't know, it's a, basically a 32 caliber projectile on 20 grains of black powder. It's basically a miniature uh, martini action, and this gun would have been used for like uh, cadet training. And uh, I, I'm not, I'm not specifically sure if this uh, firearm ever saw any kind of military service other than uh, training or anything like that. Um, but these are very sought after firearms. It's a very collectible piece. Um, 3220 is still readily available, easy to find. Of course, the Martini Action, many people are, are very familiar with. Um, they used the, the Martini Action to produce a lot of uh, the greener uh, pattern shotguns. Uh, police used those, so they had shot shell uh, versions of the Martini. They had rimfire uh, versions of the Martini that I believe, uh, yeah, Birmingham Small Arms Company also made the 22 caliber cadet version uh, of this rifle as well. Uh, very interesting uh, rifle. I can't wait to get my hands on one of these in my collection. Unfortunately, I, I really don't have the money to buy this or I would, but anyway, I thought you guys uh, would like to see this. And this one's all original, non-molested. Uh, it's a very rare specimen. All right, I'm gonna show you guys where the term purse gun came from. See this? I know you guys remember the old school purses. It's a nice little Colt for you. Very rare and obscure firearm. But uh, you guys probably wonder when, why people say purse gun. That's why they say purse gun. You know, even the uh, ladies had a little something to tuck away in their uh, handbag when they're out shopping. Very interesting piece. Smooth black finish with a satin stock. Mm. Boss, you're scaring me a little bit. <laughs> uh, we got some M1 Garands here. Uh, we're here with uh, this fellow here. He's got a lot of beautiful M1 Garands. Uh, what's your name again, sir? Bob Coy. Bob, okay. Um, how can they get in touch with you if they're interested in Garands? Well, I live over in California and I uh, have a email address of FedExMan, F-E-D-X-M-A-N, at onlymyemail.com. So that's, a, that's the best way to find me. Outstanding. He's got a beautiful selection of Garands. Uh, the one that I'm handling right here is a 7.62 caliber, which would have been a Navy gun, right? Navy. Only Navy had the... Only uh, Navy had 308s. Um, a lot of people are, are, are really hard on for M14s. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love the M14. It's a fine rifle, but I'm more of a fan of the Garand uh, just because of the history that surrounds the Garand. Uh, I know Hoss here has been kind of goo-gooing over the, uh, the Garands. Uh, what do you think, Hoss? I don't know a whole lot about them. I mean, I, I know uh, the basics, you know, most of them are chambered in 30 out 6 that take in block clips and stuff. Um, they're, they're outstanding firearms. They are, they, you know, they basically won the war. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a real, it's a weapon that, that can really take, take down pretty much anything in North America yeah. uh, or anywhere for that matter. And it was, to me, it was, it was a point at which, um, 
it, it, it really gave the Americans an advantage in, in World War II, in my opinion, because they had a semi-automatic rifle that you could have those really fast follow-up shots, whereas you, no matter how good you are with a bolt gun, you're not going to beat somebody that's, that's well-trained on a grand. So that's right. It, it was an outstanding firearm then, and, and just, just, for that, just for that, it's a, alone, it's an amazing firearm. But again, you know, now in the time that we live in now with these communist, uh, you know, states and, and laws, we, uh, you know, you can take a firearm like this, there, there's nothing wrong with this firearm at all. This is an outstanding weapon to use in everyday self-defense if you had to. Yeah, um, or, better believe it. Or hunting or, or whatever. This is an outstanding yeah. firearm for that purpose. And that's what I tell a lot of my friends who live in Canada or or Australia where they're not allowed to have some of the firearms that, that we're allowed to have here. So that's right. You know, this is this is an outstanding firearm. You should definitely take a look at it. And like yeah. Eric said, it's available in 308 in, in some cases. Uh, so it's yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, a properly trained rifleman can keep the uh, the air full of lead with one of these things. Oh, yeah. And I tell you what, I can uh, I can shoot a grand pretty quick. Uh, maybe we'll have to get one of my grands out, and I'll show you guys yeah. just how quick you can uh, dump some ammo out of a grand. Yeah, there is great guns. There's even modern uh, nylon makers who are who are doing uh, chest rigs for these things. So. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, the rifle's here to stay. I know that uh, it, you know it's the rifle that won World War II, and uh, we're gonna move along here. I know we've talked enough on this, but uh, I'm definitely a fan of the grand, and we got some beautiful ones here to show you. And you know how to get in touch with them here if you're uh, interested in buying any of these by chance. Hey guys, uh, I just wanted to show this uh, Arasaka. I don't know a lot about them, but I do know a little bit. Uh, most of them came with a chrysanthemum here, and you can see this one was was uh, scraped off. And the reason why they did that is it was a it was something that was um, considered somewhat sacred or, or, or had some sort of religious meaning to it. It was a, the royal or the imperial seal, and they didn't want it to be captured, so they were scraped off or or uh, scra uh, taken off. Um, again, I, I'm not an expert. Uh, the the Arasakas that I have, the, the butt stocks are actually wood, which indicate that they're a late war uh, firearm uh, because they they started running out of the manufacturing capabilities to do these good metal butt plates. Um, so that's about that's about all all I know about the firearms personally. Uh, my my grandfather, the ones that I have, he actually picked them up. Uh, he got them from a villager in uh, during the Korean War who gave them to him as a gift for saving his village uh, when he landed his his Marines in there so uh, that was that's kind of a little history that I know about it and then I have a bayonet for this that my father picked up in Guam out in the jungles as he was out there as a kid growing up he found a, a bayonet out there I have some of those videos on on my YouTube page uh, about those things if you guys want to see them so Got a beautiful uh, rack of uh, Japanese firearms. I'm holding a, uh, a Type 18 Murata, and uh, this is one of the early uh, transitional black powder uh, single shot rifles that the Japanese military, uh, you know, developed early on. Uh, you can tell it's definitely got the uh, the large uh, locking surface, much like the Dutch Beaumont does. So uh, this is, of course, an 11 millimeter. I'm not sure of the exact caliber, but an 11 millimeter bore uh, rifle. And of course, earlier in the show, we showed you the repeater version of the Murata, which was uh, converted to a later, you know, like eight or nine millimeter diameter uh, small bore round, which of course is a very uh, obscure and rare firearm. Uh, but these uh, Miratas are just awesome guns. I wish I had one in my collection. I'd love to buy this one, but I'm a little bit tapped on money right now, so I think we're going to have to look at it later. But uh, beautiful firearm. Looks like it has an original sling, which of course is very, very uncommon. Uh, this is definitely a very nice specimen. Let's move on. We'll show you some other cool stuff as we're uh, moving along here. All right, we're going to show you guys some uh, you know, smaller scale cannons here. I'm here with Rick at uh, Neff Cannons. I make a bunch of these and small reduced scale cannons. Okay, everything I build is uh, replicas of the Civil War. We're looking at one third scale field pieces. We got three inch Hornet rifle, the Napoleon and a Confederate parrot. The mortar down below is one half scale, slightly underboard to shoot a tennis ball. I fill that full of sand. I can get 400 yards out of that tennis ball. Oh, wow. Pretty impressive. You'll see it in flight the whole time. All right. So one, one of these, one of these uh, little guys will launch a uh, golf ball. These actually. This shoot. one right here under the Napoleon will launch a golf ball. Okay. 
I fired them golf balls, they'll go over 450 yards. You won't see them in flight at that fast, so the fun's out of it when you can't see a, a mortar shell fly, uh, in flight. Yeah, maybe we'll have to put together a uh, test fire, have you guys demonstrate your cannons for us. We'll have to, we'll, get we'll have to do some, burn some powder. We'd love that, yeah. And I see you've got a... Uh, Malta, Idaho. Okay. And I see you've got a, a soda can launcher here. A little soda mortar. Can. And you take your concrete can, uh, concrete soda can, and it launches that out of there. Very cool uh, little mortar there. 350 yards for that. Oh wow, can. we'd love to see that. Well, uh, good looking products, guys. Uh, we wish you all the best, and we'll make sure to. If you guys are interested in looking at these cannons, uh, we'll put their uh, link down in the description box. Be sure to contact them if you're interested in checking them out. All right, well, we finished up at the Antique Arms Show over there, and uh, we were able to uh, find some things to follow us home. Picked up a uh, 1888 commission rifle. This one is Turk marked. Um, J bore, so it's an early one. Very uh, awesome gun. It's got the uh, barrel shroud. I mean, obviously the barrel's not really that big. Uh, the, the actual diameter of the barrel's not unlike a regular Mauser, but it's got a shroud over it. Um, nice little gun. Picked this one up for 200, so I, I feel like I got a really good deal there. And we were able to pick up a uh, 7184. This is a 11 millimeter Mauser rifle. And uh, this is a tube fed gun, a repeater. And I was able to pick this one up for uh, for 400. So I feel like I did pretty good there. I, I feel like that was a good investment for that amount of money. And uh, the place we're at right now is the Range 702. Uh, very cool place. Uh, as you guys remember last year, we had the Fostec shoot. Uh, we shot the Origins, uh, we shot the the bump skis and everything. And uh, these guys have been very, very accommodating, uh, helping us with the gun transfer, helping us with range time. So uh, we definitely wanted to end up here uh, just because these folks have been very accommodating, very forthcoming, uh, helping us out. And uh, I also appreciate yeah. you running around with me, man. Yeah, thanks for letting me hang out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> What'd you think about the arm show? It was great. You know, it's one of those things where you get to hang out and uh, see stuff from history and learn a lot. That's awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's not enough uh, guys like us that are younger kind of trying to get into it and keep the history and the traditions alive, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah, you're right there. Well, um, guys, if you haven't, I would definitely check out Hoss. Uh, it's the Hoss USMC on YouTube. Uh, he's got a great YouTube channel, very good guy, and uh, he's a personal friend of mine. So, you know, we hang out and everything, but uh, we thought this video would be just a fun concept. Uh, I know SHOT Show, we cover a lot of the uh, random you know, new guns and all the new stuff that's on the market, but the Antique Arms Show is an awesome chance uh, to get your hands on old stuff. You know, no one thinks about SHOT Show as being related to older firearms, but with the Antique Arms Show overlapping SHOT Show, uh, I think that yeah. unfortunately it gets overshadowed by SHOT Show, uh, but we always like to get our hands on the antiques. So uh, I was able to acquire a few specimens today. We had a, a great time out at the uh, Antique Arms Show. Appreciate y'all watching and uh, we'll catch you guys soon. Make sure you can hear something above his head too.